A new source of power for vessels in Singapore's waters, the first electric charging point for harbour craft has been launched in a trial to find out how many such stations are needed and where. There are up to 2,000 such vessels that ply Singapore's port waters. And they will all have to be greener by 2050 as part of the maritime sector's efforts to decarbonise. Charlotte Lim with more. This vessel can be fully charged in three hours and it's ready to take its next load of passengers to ships anchored just a few kilometres away. There are currently just a handful of electric hovercraft in Singapore's waters. To encourage more to jump on board, a public charging point has been placed here in Marina South Pier. The very first charging point itself in a public pier allows us to test out uh, the technical requirements and how it operates and certainly it also allows uh, all the industry players around us including various uh, launcher operators as well as uh, charger operators and shipyards to look at the feasibility and hopefully with that they can actually help to push this electrification. Authorities are piloting various ways to charge electric hovercraft. For instance, this cargo vessel uses battery swapping, which may let it go further out in Singapore's waters. These trials will be used to develop plans for more charging infrastructure. From 2030, all new hovercraft have to be electric or use other types of greener fuel. As the industry starts to change, we see new technologies being deployed. We are able to bring in new expertise from even beyond maritime, bring it in this sector and to incorporate uh, data, incorporate digitalization, incorporate new propulsion chain to create products that are more productive, that has a higher amount of uh, productivity level compared to existing diesel-based vessels. The public will be able to see these new crafts and more at Marina South Pier this weekend, ahead of Singapore Maritime Week. For a close look, we're joined by Sam Chua. He's principal of advisory APEC at research and energy intelligence company Rystead Energy. Thanks so much for coming this evening, Mr. Yes. Chua. Thank you for having me on the show. Now, this is a pilot program, right? Uh, the first electric charging point for harbour craft. The potential is there. You can always scale this up depending on how this pilot goes. How significant is it now and what is its potential? Yes, uh, I think to give it a little bit of context, uh, we understand that Singapore is on a very ambitious plan to decarbonize its maritime sector. So there is a lot of opportunities to de decarbonize uh, many various segments of the industry. And one of the main areas would be you know, the harbour crafts. We understand that Singapore has about 1,600 vessels today, so the potential is relatively mm -hmm. material. Uh, I think why this is very significant is of three main reasons. One is that First, Singapore, this outlines Singapore's very clear commitment to decarbonize the sector and uh, to, to achieve its net zero target by 2050. Um, number two is more around the fact that we do see that this will help to provide a lot of uh, assurance for overcoming the infrastructure challenges that we see in this sector as well. So uh, overall, I think adopting EHCs in general, there will be some uh, market, you know, uncertainties to adopting some of these. And the third point, I think, which is also very important, is how it helps to provide a proof of concept to many people as well. So I think from an operational front, not many players have actually experienced something new like this. Mm, so uh, help us understand then the electric harbour craft. Uh, what can they be used for? I mean, I, they're generally small vehicles, uh, uh, vessels, aren't they? Yeah, uh, yeah I, I think right now we do see that the potential is uh, there. First of all, I think for the harbour crafts, there are many different segments that we understand today. Yeah. One of them is mainly usage of it as tugboats, passenger ferries uh, and uh, cargo, light cargo carries. And also there are other patrol vehicle uh, vessels as well. Mm. There are many others more, uh, of which I think we do understand that I think passenger ferries are one of the more dominant ones mm. alongside cargo ferries because they, are, they serve the larger maritime sector yeah. here. So as of now, I think a lot of the e-harbour uh, crafts, I think they are looking at serving the ferry, uh, uh, passenger ferry segment. Uh, but I do believe that there is potential to serve other segments as well. Mm. Although I think for tugboats and rest, I think that's not as prominent. But we do expect to see them scale up eventually. 
All right, uh, let's pick up on that and this sure. idea of other segments. Let's take a look at other green fuel vessels. Singapore is exploring in its voyage to reach net zero, as Mr. Troy mentioned, by 2050. Well, these include this wing-in ground craft developed by ST Engineering. It's called Air X. It creates air pressure with the water surface to fly. It's up to three times faster than a traditional speedboat and can seat up to eight passengers. Last month, Singapore hosted the world's first use of ammonia as marine fuel in combination with diesel. A liquid ammonia was loaded into the Fortescue Green Pioneer, an offshore supply vessel. Oh, Mr. Chua, uh, we just took a look at that. That looks like something out of, I don't know, Star Wars in the water, I suppose. Uh, of all the things you mentioned, so for example, you're saying the three areas in which Singapore can decarbonise its maritime sector. This is just one of them. For example, something like that. In terms of how much this can contribute to our net zero journey, yep. what is its potential? Uh, well, Jeremy, we do understand that you know Singapore tends to adopt a more multi-pronged approach towards this. So. Again, not just e harbor crafts, but uh, adoption of other alternative fuels is also on the table. Uh, mm -hmm. Especially new technologies like this, I think, is also worth considering as well. Mm -hmm. What we understand, you know, such vessels itself is actually relatively interesting because, first of all, I think it is more fuel efficient, yep. it is faster, and likewise, it also can go at pretty fast speed as well. So it does serve a certain segment, potentially a growing segment in the future. Uh, but, you know, as of today, I think it's something that is worth considering. Mm. But one thing that I find very interesting is that, you know, how do we actually see its use in our very busy seaports here, yeah. where there are large cargo ships, and how does it navigate and go about that? There are definitely, you know, regulatory and safety concerns around that, but I'm pretty sure this is something that is worth exploring. Yeah. Maybe beyond that, there will be more commercial scaling and deployment of such vessels. Well, you, you talked about concerns. Uh, let's let's talk a bit more about that. We've seen electric, ammonia, air pressure. How does the maritime industry mitigate safety concerns that come with um, the newer fuels, transporting them, disposing of them? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I guess for this segment, I think one thing that's probably that's very familiar to me will be ammonia. Mm. So I think ammonia is toted as one of the fuels that's likely to serve the maritime sector in the future, be it for mostly for cargo segments. There is a lot of safety concerns with regards to that, emission concerns with regards to that. Uh, but I think what the concerns are, I think first of all, I think Singapore has already had some experience in dealing with such uh, fuels especially for ammonia. So there is already some level of familiarity that they are. Uh, they, they would be able to appreciate and uh, deploy in general for, uh, for the larger segment as a, as a whole. Um, but of course, I think there is still a lot of hesitation by the market to go about this. So I think for even for e uh, harbour crafts as well, there is definitely some hesitation around there. Safety, because again, not many operators have actually used this. Mm -hmm. So I think it will say it's more of a learning curve it's not something that is something that we definitely know, we definitely should go along with it. I think it's more around the fact that, you know, it's kind of a journey to get there. So, but I think Singapore is of a certain starting point. All right, final question, Mr. Troy. In fact, in this very short conversation we've yes. had with you, you've been, you've been very careful to point out that we should not be over-optimistic, but in all things to be balanced. So, obvious things like market uncertainties, regulatory uncertainties, yeah. but the fact that, and also we need an ecosystem. Singapore is a very small part However hard, however good our intentions, we are just a very little part of a much larger player that needs to get in on the green, the green journey. Uh, do you think by, that by doing what we're doing, small as it may be, it can set some kind of example for others to follow suit? Yeah, uh, certainly I, I believe very strongly in that as well. Because first of all, I think Singapore is definitely one of the largest or the, one of the busiest port in the world and that in the maritime sector we definitely have a say on some of those uh, trends that we're seeing. A lot of the technologies we do have a say about how we adopt it. A lot of players are looking at us, a lot of countries are also looking at us and seeing how we adapt to those uh, regulations. So even be it small, I think it's also seen that uh, Singapore is willing to play its cards evenly as well. I think that's the part that people want to see this as a test bit because this is a perfect test bit for, you know, aside from all regulatory uncertainties, a lot of safety uncertainties, technology has a very safe space to play here. The government is also careful about doing it. 
So I think there is much that everybody wants to look to Singapore to see how they could scale it up. And then eventually there is a lot of cross learnings that other sectors and other countries are very, mm-hmm. very willing to actually scale up. We know that Singapore is already like very vocal in some of these international consortiums to push for multi-fuels, multi-technologies. So I don't see how, I think Singapore will still play a very pivotal role, be it in size. Oh, thanks for, for coming in this evening as well and joining us for this conversation. Sam Chua, Principal of Advisory, APEC at Rice Energy.